My name is Tim Oaks. I'm one of the surgeons here. I guess I'm the only thoracic surgeon here. But um, <laughs> anyhow, today we're going to talk about lung cancer. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, where we stand today with lung cancer. We're going to talk about signs and symptoms of lung cancer, talk about the treatment, and then we're going to talk a little bit about what the future holds for diagnosing and treating lung cancer. So if you can't hear me or if you have any questions, just stop me throughout the uh, uh, talk and we'll, we'll be happy to answer those questions, okay? Well, what do normal lungs look like? Well, this is a set of normal lungs uh, obviously on your, your left, uh, abnormal lungs on the right. Uh, they're taken from pigs who were forced to inhale uh, two packs of cigarettes a day for one year. And that's what your lungs look like after, after that time frame. Here's really what we're dealing with. These are human, this is an autopsy series, autopsy study, but if you look you can see that there's this very large tumor present in what would be the left lung with all these other spots here throughout. Those are where the lymph nodes have been involved with lung cancer. So the tumors up here in the lung, you can see there's multiple lymph nodes here along the windpipe and other scattered nodules throughout the lungs as well. Well, what is lung cancer? Well, what it is, it's the leading cause of cancer deaths in the United States. More people die of lung cancer every year than breast, colon, and prostate combined. So more people die of lung cancer per year than breast, colon, and prostate combined. This is taken from the American uh, College of Surgeons and the American Cancer Society. If you look at all the uh, new cancer cases that are diagnosed in 2013, you see that in men, prostate will account for 28% of all the cancers. Lung cancer will be 14% in men. But in women, it's sort of reversed. Breast is about 28 or 29%. Lung cancer, about 14%. But if you look at the deaths, in the United States from cancers, you see that 28% of all cancer deaths are caused by lung cancer in men and 26% in women. So what does that tell you? Well, it tells you that one, lung cancer is common and lung cancer is deadly, it's mortal. Many, many people who are diagnosed with it are, uh, die of lung cancer, unfortunately. Now, here's the good news. Uh, if you look, in the early 1940s and 1950s, you can see that the risk of people dying from lung cancer went way up. And it peaked in the 1990s and is now slowly starting to fall off. So that if you look at the, uh, the uh, lung cancer death rates among men, you can see that it's declining pretty rapidly. And it's also true for women. Now the incidence is not as high and you can see that for lung and uh, bronchus cancer, the risk is sort of slowly declining. But really, you know what this takes into account? This is the age, this is before my time, but in the 1940s, remember anybody, in the, anybody here born and then one or two people maybe? But remember, you know, GIs used to get cigarettes. R.J. Reynolds used to supply cigarettes with all the rations. Smoking was very, very common in the 1940s, and there's a lag time, because you know, if you smoke, you don't get cancer immediately, it takes years and years. And you can see that the peak occurred in the 1980s, probably about 30 years after the peak of cigarette consumption actually started. And if you look at the trends in cigarette use in the United States, you can see that in 1965, more than half of the people, half of men smoked, and that is slowly, slowly declining, and now I just saw an ad, uh, on TV the other day it said 18% of adults are now smoking. So on this slide in 2011 it was about 30%. So we're making good, good progress in uh, you know, making the uh, use of cigarette consumption decline across the United States. And that correlates with the decline in uh, uh, lung cancer. Well what is it? What is really lung cancer though is we're going to talk about it today. 
It's defined as a, an invasive tumor that starts in one of the major airways, uh, some of the smaller bronchial tubes, or in the lung substance itself. So anywhere from, you know, basically from your major bronchial tubes all the way down into the lung. Any tumor that starts there is considered to be lung cancer. What it is not is a tumor that starts somewhere else and spreads to the lungs. So if you have colon cancer that spreads to the lungs, <clears throat> that's not considered lung cancer. That's considered colon cancer. So I will frequently have patients who say, well, you know, it started off as colon cancer, but it ended up as lung cancer. Well, that's not really, what, that's not really true. What we're talking about are tumors that actually arise in the lung. And another name for this, if any of you ever go back and read any older papers about it or see any, uh, uh, anything in the newspapers or magazines, it's oftentimes called bronchogenic carcinoma. Bronco meaning bronchial tubes and genic meaning that's where it starts from. So bronchogenic carcinoma are tumors that start in the bronchial tubes. And that's another name for lung cancer that we're going to be talking about. So here's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about the causes of lung cancer. What are the signs and symptoms? How do you diagnose it? How do you treat it? What is the prognosis for it? How do you prevent it? And then finally, what's the future hold for the treatment? So that's a lot to cover in an hour, but we're gonna do it. Okay, so who gets lung cancer? Well, it's pretty clear, I think, to everybody in the room that most people who get lung cancer are smokers. Um, smoking accounts for about 85 to 90% of all cases of lung cancer. Now, 85 to 90 percent, that's not 100 percent, and there are still many people in the United States who develop lung cancer who've never smoked. And I'll show you a slide on that in just a minute. Secondhand smoke. We know that people who live in a household in which their spouse or their parents or siblings have smoked, they're at a higher risk. One of the more common ones is radon, and it's estimated that radon will cause 10 percent of all lung cancers. Anybody buy or sell a house in the last couple years, you have to get a radon inspection. And that's the reason, because of the incidence of lung cancer. So, if you ever, if you, I, I, when we bought our house, we had, a, we had a radon inspection that was elevated, so we had to install some sort of radon scavenging system. But the reason for that is because of the incidence of lung cancer. Radon is a gas, and it leaches up through the soil and then you inhale it. And if you inhale it for a long enough period of time, you end up with lung cancer. So 10% of all cases, that's an awful lot of case, that's an awful lot of cases that are caused. Yes. Does radon have an odor? No, it's an odorless gas. <clears throat> um, other causes, asbestos. So many of the people who um, worked in the Navy shipyards over the years. Uh, people used to ask, uh, asbestos was used in brake lining, so people who are mechanics were exposed to asbestos without knowing it. Uh, and if you smoke and were exposed to asbestos, your risk of developing lung cancer is astronomically high. Other things like air pollution have uh, caused it. Exposure to certain chemicals can cause it. Uh, things such as uranium, we know that. That's a radioactive material that causes cancer. Uh, witness what happened in Japan after the uh, bombs. Beryllium, gasoline, diesel exhaust, arsenic, genetics. So if any of your primary um, relatives, bloodline relatives have had lung cancer, you're at a higher risk for it. And finally, prior radiation to the breast or to the lungs. And we see a lot of women nowadays who are opting for lumpectomy, and radiation therapy for breast cancer. But unfortunately, unless someone counsels those people to stop smoking, they are at a very high risk of developing lung cancer in that part of the chest that was radiated for their breast cancer. And I don't think many women appreciate the fact that, you know, that they are at a setup for that. So when we, when we have patients here in the cancer center that we're treating for breast cancer, we always include smoking cessation as part of their treatment because of the risk of developing lung cancer. All right, well, here's what, here's what I was telling you about earlier. We say that, you know, most people who smoke, or most lung cancer occurs in pa patients who smoke, but that's not necessarily true. 
I, what I've put up here is a slide showing the different types of lung cancer. Now, lung cancer is defined in many different ways, but one of them is the way they appear under the microscope. So when a pathologist looks at it under the microscope, they'll say, well, this is an adenocarcinoma. That name's not all that important to our discussion, but, but what it does is it tells the pathologist, how does it appear under the microscope? Well, as you can see, a pretty good number of patients with adenocarcinoma of the lung have never smoked. And the same is true for something called uh, squamous cell carcinoma, which is this blue box. So again, there's some non-smokers in there. Uh, other types of lung cancer, as you can see, um, there's a fair number of people that have never smoked. That's where that radon exposure to other things. And, and in fact, you know, I mean, lung cancer has been identified in Egyptian mummies. So it's been around for 2,000 years. This is not something that is just new but it's much more prevalent obviously now than it has been. All right, so not everyone with lung cancer has a smoking history. Some patients have no known risk factors and yet are unfortunate and develop this. But it has other, smoking has other ill effects. When I told my mother that, she said, well then now I can smoke, right? <laughs> I'm like, no, no, you can't. One, you know, it costs you over $2,000 a year to smoke. If you smoke two packs of cigarettes a day and you buy those cheap cigarettes um, at $7, at $3.50 a pack for $7 a day, that comes to $2,500 a year. That's just the financial impact, not to mention all the other risk factors like COPD, atherosclerosis, myocardial infarction, and all that stuff. So smoking has a big impact on our health. Now I just want to tell you, not everybody who smokes develops lung cancer. I mean. It seems to be that case in my clinic. Everybody comes in there and smokes, but that's not true though. Um, if you look here at this graph, on the bottom here is age. So if you're 75 years of age and you smoke two packs of cigarettes a day, your risk of developing lung cancer is 16%. So, you know, you that means you have an 84% chance of not getting lung cancer. Or another way of looking at it, if you if you're 65 but you quit when you turn 60, you can see that your risk of developing lung cancer fell down to 12%. Or if you quit when you were 50, it fell down to 7%. So the bottom line is, some people say, well, I've been smoking all my life. I'm 60 years old, there's no sense in me quitting now. Yeah, there is. Here's the data right here, it shows you that. Another way of looking at it is say, okay, well, I've been smoking all my life, two packs a day, why should I cut back to one pack a day? Well, here's the data for that. Again, it shows you the number of years that you've been smoking, and whether you smoke one pack a day, one, uh, half a pack a day, or one pack a day, no, if you've never smoked, smoke half a pack or one pack, you can see that your risk of developing lung cancer goes up with the more cigarettes that you smoke. Any questions about that? Is that pretty clear? Yes. Um, what about the whole, the whole effect of secondhand smoke? How long should you have been exposed? I was exposed for the first 22 years of my life to secondhand smoke. Yeah. You know, nobody knows the answers to those questions, but we do know that in broad, broad um, population based studies, that if you are exposed to secondhand smoke, you're at a higher risk. <clears throat> but whether that means, you know, if you have a spouse that smokes in the same room or in the same house, you know, how big your house is, whether your house had radon, it's hard to control for all those variables, but um, the bottom line is you should try to avoid it as much as possible. Okay, so what are the signs and symptoms? Symptoms are what the patient comes in complaining of. Signs are what the doctor finds when he examines somebody. So the symptoms, patients would have cough. They might cough up blood, that's called hemoptysis. And I hear people say, well, you know, it's just a little bit of blood wasn't much. It happened about two weeks ago, I was nothing. And the truth, of the, time, the truth of the matter is most of the time it is nothing, you know. It's, uh, you know, upper respiratory tract infection, but if it persists, then that's something you need to make sure you see your doctor about. Shortness of breath, but you know most people who are smokers are short of breath anyhow, all the time. But if there's a change in their shortness of breath, if they have wheezing, fatigue, or weight loss, well, geez, you know, they're pretty nonspecific symptoms. 
Some of the signs you might find, decreased breath sounds. If you listen to a patient's lungs, they may have diminished breath sounds on one side or another. They might have wheezing. They might have clubbing of their fingers. And oftentimes I'll look at patients' fingernails to see. And one of the signs of lung cancer is that their fingernails undergo changes. So if you ever wonder why the doctor's looking at your fingernails, it's not just to admire your beautician or your you know, your uh, manicurist work. He actually wants to see whether your fingernails are changed in their shape. Um, you can see droopy eyelids. Sometimes your eyelids become drooped because of the nerves that go to your eyelids are controlled from nerves down here in your chest. And if the lung cancer is involving those, those nerves, it can actually make your eyelids droop. And you might see hoarseness. So patients will come in complaining of you know, I just don't, <clears throat> I got a, got my voice is hoarse. I don't really know what that's from. And you get an x-ray, a chest x-ray, because of the high risk of lung cancer and hoarseness being uh, rep co-represented. Okay, well, what might your doctor do? Well, most of the time you're going to get an x-ray. Almost everybody gets an x-ray. Uh, if your symptoms persist and you go back to your doctor, you know, Maybe after a couple weeks, they usually give you a course of antibiotics because they really don't know what else to give you. So you get some antibiotics, come back in a couple weeks. Well, you come back and you still have the same symptoms, then you usually get a chest x-ray. And then that usually prompts a CT scan. And then the CT scan usually prompts a PET scan. It almost always goes like that. Um, and for those of you that don't know what a PET scan is, a PET scan stands for something called positron emission tomography. That's too much to say, so we just say PET scan. But a PET scan um, is another way of looking at whether or not spots or nodules in the lungs might be cancerous and whether or not they might have spread. Very rarely do we do MRI scans anymore or bone scans, but occasionally you might need those. But if you have, if you have an abnormality on your x-ray, you almost always get a CT scan. If there's an abnormality there, you almost always get a PET scan. Pretty much goes in that, in that direction. And a biopsy is usually done of something. Now the biopsy can be done of your lungs if there's a spot in the lung or if one of these CT scans or PET scans shows some enlarged lymph glands, maybe they'll try to biopsy them. Or if it shows that there's a spot in the liver, they might try to biopsy the liver. And so if you biopsy the liver and it shows lung cancer, well then you pretty much know what the spot in the lung is. Whereas if you have a spot in the lung and in the liver and you biopsy the lung and it shows lung cancer, you're still not quite sure what's in the liver. So we, we usually do these studies to try to give us the best uh, estimate of where the tumor might have spread to before we do any biopsies. Now, in my case, as a surgeon, I don't always do a biopsy. Uh, if the patient is a good risk candidate for surgery, and it looks like lung cancer, and I think that they're gonna to have to have surgery anyhow, I don't oftentimes do the biopsy, I just go straight to the operating room. And with experience and with the current technology we have today, you know, you're right 95% of the time um, before you go to the operating room. But so biopsy is not absolutely necessary, but it frequently is done. <clears throat> now, one of the things that patients always wanna know and they'll always ask, they'll say is, well, what stage of cancer is this? Or the family will want to know. They'll say, well, is this an advanced stage? You know, can you tell us that? Well, the purpose of doing all these studies is to determine what the stage is. Because if the tumor has spread beyond what surgery can remove, then surgery is not part of the treatment plan. If the tumor is localized to just the lung, then surgery may be possible. Um, so we want to know what the stage is, and so the purpose of doing the CT scan, the PET scan, and the biopsies is all to determine what the treatment's going to be based upon the stage and what the prognosis is. I think it's pretty clear to say that everybody would understand that an earlier stage cancer is better than a later stage cancer, and a stage one cancer is better than a stage four cancer. And I just want to show you what we use to stage these tumors. All tumors in your body, whether it's a breast cancer, prostate cancer, lung cancer, colon cancer, use something called a TNM classification. And that TNM classification stands for tumor, nodes, and metastases. So the tumor is how big is the tumor, where is it located, 
nodes, are there nodes close to the tumor, far away from the tumor, and M, meaning has it spread beyond the lung, has it gone to other, other organ systems. And I'm not going to go over this, and for those of you that work with me know I can't remember this, so I carry it around on a card, laminated in my pocket because I cannot possibly remember all that. But this is the way we think of it when we're seeing patients and we sit down to discuss with them what the options are. We go through this TNM classification. And basically what it boils down to in a simplified form is that a stage one cancer of the lung is a tumor that's confined to the lung, hasn't spread anywhere else. Small tumor in the lung, we're good. Stage two, eh, not quite so good because some of the lymph nodes that are inside the lung are involved. Stage three, getting a little bit worse because the lymph nodes outside the lung are involved. And then stage four is where it's actually spread to other body parts, like to the liver, to the brain, to the bones. So obviously stage one is good if you had to have cancer. Stage four, not so good. And here's the reason why all this is important. This is the prognosis. So remember I told you early on that lung cancer, pretty deadly disease to have. And if you look at stage one cancer of the lung, that's this blue thing right here. They're subsequently divided into A and B and all that stuff. That's not important. But if you look out at 10 years, if you have lung cancer in its earliest stages, only 50% of the people are alive. That's in its earliest stages. In stage four, which is this line, you can see that by, you know, two years, only 10% of the people are alive. So the, the rationale for the reason why we do all that staging is to figure out where the patient's going to be on this bar, on these graphs, and to determine, okay, if the patient's in this particular group, what can we offer them that's going to result in some improved survival? Now, this is really complicated, but I think it's kind of interesting. <clears throat> I just want you to look at this data down here. This is taken from the Medicare, so you know Medicare has thousands and thousands and thousands of patients. The majority of people who develop lung cancer are in the Medicare age population. Not all, but most of them are. So this comes from Medicare. If you look at all stages for lung, of lung cancer, um, this is males and females, all all people who are diagnosed with lung cancer, their chance of living five years for a male is 15%. For a female, it's 20%. If it's localized, meaning it's you know, just in the lung, it's 48% for men and 58% for women. But if you just look at this group right here, this is all patients, 17% of people who are diagnosed with lung cancer will live five years. That's it. That means 83% of them are deceased within five years of their lung cancer. Now we're doing a little bit better. So this first column here is 1975 to 1979, and then it goes all the way out to 2008, which is when, which is when I had the last slides updated. But you can see that in 1979, 1975 to 1979, your chance of living one year after the diagnosis of lung cancer was 36%. Now it's up to 46%. Whoopee. Uh, your chance of living five years went from 12% to 17%. Not exactly great, great strides, right? So obviously we've got to look at something else. And again, I just blew that slide up a little bit to show you now, in 2000, the year 2000, your chance of living one year after the diagnosis of lung cancer was 42%, and in 2008, it climbed all the way to 46%. Not great. So, obviously, the treatment we're doing must not be very effective. Well, what is the treatment? Well, for stage one cancers of the lung, that are cancers that are located in the lung, uh, without any spread anywhere else, surgery is the preferred treatment. Now the surgery that I do today really hasn't changed much in the last 60 or 70 years. It's basically removing the lung. Now we do it a little bit more safely, 
But if you get through the operation, the, the, the end result is the same in that that portion of the lung was removed. Well, surgeons have been doing that for a long time. They really haven't made that much of a difference. Um, if it involves the lymph nodes within the lung, then surgery again is the preferred treatment because you remove the tumor and the lymph nodes. Sometimes radiation and chemotherapy can be used in people who either refuse surgery or who are not candidates for surgery. For stage three, where the lymph nodes are involved outside the lung, then obviously taking the lung out isn't going to help you any. So we don't use surgery for stage three tumors. We uh, use radiation therapy and chemotherapy. And if you have a stage four tumor where it's spread beyond the lung, then we just use chemotherapy alone. So, the treatment is also determined by those things I told you at the beginning, that adenocarcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma. It, it is, but for, it's only affected a little bit. The majority of the results are determined by the stage. The actual name for the tumor, whether it's a, a squamous cell or an adenocarcinoma or a large cell neuroendocrine undifferentiated, that really isn't all that port, important. But there are two main types of lung cancer, small cell and non-small cell. And that first graph I showed you where it showed the smokers and the non-smokers, those were the non-small cell, and that's the majority of them. About 25% of the tumors are called small cell. And they're called that because they got little tiny, tiny, tiny cells under the microscope. And when you look at it under the microscope, they look like little dots compared to the bigger blood, vessel, the bigger blood cells around them. And that small cell is a different story, so we're not really going to talk about that today. That's a totally different story. But the majority of lung cancer is called non-small cell, and the majority of them are called adeno or squamous. Those are the two most common types. But there are some, <clears throat> there are some differences between the cell types, but again, it's relatively minor, and for, our, uh, for all intents and purposes, I lump them all together. Yes, sir. Uh <clears throat> Your small cell versus non-small cell, or is one more detrimental to having than the other person? The other? Yeah, small cell. Small cell is worse. But it's only, you know, like, well, only 25%. It's still a lot. <clears throat> but, <clears throat> excuse me, most of the cancers <clears throat> that we see are, are, uh, large, are non-small cell. It gets confusing because one, one of the main types of non-small cell is called large cell. Don't ask. <laughs> um, so what can you do? What kind of operations can you do? Well, you can do something called a wedge resection. If you have a tumor uh, in the top part of the right lung here, you can do a wedge resection where you just sort of take a wedge out of a cheese wheel or a piece of cake, you know, a round cake. You can just cut a wedge of it out or a pizza. It looks like a little wedge. You can remove it. That's, uh, that's, that can be okay. You can imagine, though, that you don't get a whole lot of normal tissue around that lung cancer, but you do get some. You can take out an entire lobe where you just remove the whole thing for bigger tumors. You might want to just take the whole lobe out. Of course, the more you take out, the less you leave for the patient to breathe with. You can take out the whole lung if you want. We don't do that very often because, again, that only leaves you with one lung to breathe on. So we don't usually take, we usually try to do the least we can to remove the tumor. Uh, so. What about radiation therapy? Yeah, you can do radiation therapy. Traditional radiation therapy used to get it five days a week for six weeks. You know, about 30 treatments, maybe. You know, sometimes I'd have to stop them for a period of time. Most of the patients, you know, didn't tolerate it completely, so they'd have to have a break in between. Um, but you can still use it, uh, and we do use it quite a bit. It can be used to treat painful bone metastases or brain metastases. So if you have a lung cancer and it spreads to the bones, that's very painful. Uh, you can give one or two days of treatment to that part and it's very effective, or to the brain. And then there are newer types that are something called SBRT, which I'm gonna show you about here in just a minute, that compete with surgery for early stages of lung tumors. Oh. Yeah. Uh, now I'm going to have to have two of these things. Now. I'm going to get confused. Um, there are some newer types of radiation therapy out there I'm going to show you about. You can see it behind that wall over there. If you could look through it, you would see it. That's our brand new SBRT machine. Dr. Crystal is very proud of it. Cone spent several millions of dollars installing it for us. 
We're thankful for them and they provide us with the brand new state-of-the-art SBRT machine, which I'm going to show you pictures of in just a little bit. What about chemotherapy for lung cancer? Well, chemotherapy really doesn't play a whole lot uh, of role in curing patients of lung cancer, but it does play a large role in palliation, meaning it doesn't really cure patients, but it can prolong their life. Um, and as I said earlier, most patients present with advanced stages of lung cancer, so chemotherapy is given to most of those patients, and it, and it plays a significant role in prolonging patients' life with good quality of life, but it probably is not curative. And again, the reason why we figure all this out, if you look at the five-year survival, all patients with stage one, you know, about 50% perhaps survival rates. So when I finish an operation, I come out and I talk to the family, the first thing they always want to know is, did you get it all? You say, yeah, I think we did. Oh, thank the Lord, she's cured. Well, really you're thinking, eh, not really. I did the best I can, I did the right operation. You know, hopefully everything's gonna be okay with the surgery, but even now I know that 50% of those people are still gonna be dead within five years. Yes, ma'am. <coughs> The purpose of chemo, is it really to kill all the cancer cells in your body or to prolong your life? But you mentioned that because I had you know. Well, I mean that. Prolonged cancer? No, for just any cancer, <coughs> cancer cell. Is well, it to prolong your life, like, you know, trying to kill all the cancer cells in your body, or does it? Does well, the goal, the goal obviously is to cure you. I mean, it's uh -huh. to kill all of them. Okay. But the reality is that it rarely ever does. And, and, and uh, again, you know, if you look here, the five-year survival with uh, lung cancer is not zero. I mean, it's like one or two percent, which means that one or two people out of a hundred will be cured with chemotherapy, but it's only one or two percent out of, you know, out of a hundred patients. Yes? Back to that last chart there. I, I'm sorry, I'm not taking questions from you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> One of my former patients. <laughs> yes, sir. Former right. patient. Mm -hmm. um, that survival rate of 50%. Do the, the, do the 50% that die due to the age which most people get lung cancer, is, do they die from cancer or yeah. they're just dead? Well, no, you're, no you're, you're right. And again, it would be most of these people who develop either stage one, two, three, or four, whatever stage, they're all about the same age. Yeah. You know, they're all in their 60s or 70s. So again, if you look at the survival rates, you'll see that they, it's, it's related to the, the stage of the disease and not just their age. Okay. So it, it, you're right. And, that, and then people tell you that, it's an important point you made. I'm surprised. No, I'm not. Because you, you always ask me, you always, I always have to schedule two hours for your appointment because you always ask me these questions. Um, no, it, it's true because whenever you say, well, uh, you know, only 50% of the people survived, well, maybe they all died of a heart attack, you know, and it had nothing to do with their lung cancer. Well, that's a good question because, again, most of these people, you know, the majority of them are in their 60s and 70s where other cardiovascular diseases, you know, kick in, and so. But the truth is, the majority of the deaths were due to lung cancer in these groups. You. You're welcome. No more questions. <laughs> All right. So, so clearly, then, the prognosis is related to the stage of the tumor. So if you could discover them all when they were stage ones, before they became twos and threes and fours, you'd be better off. And so uh, people have now started looking into screening for lung cancer so that you could find an incidental lung cancer at an early stage. And we know that chest x-ray is not very sensitive because it has to be at least 10 millimeters or one centimeter to even show up on an x-ray. But a CT scan, it can be down to two millimeters and you can see it on a CT scan. So, you know, we do uh, screening for other things. We do screening for breast cancer, right? We, uh, women get mammograms annually for a certain period of time. Uh, we do colonoscopy every couple years for certain people, yes? Dr. O, is there any other disease besides cancer that you can have in your lung? Oh yeah, there's lots of disease, but mostly emphysema, you know, COPD. Uh, that's the more common thing. Like I said, even if you smoke all your life, you only have an, only 
a 16% chance of developing lung cancer, but you have an 84% chance of getting other diseases in the lungs, like emphysema and, and fibrosis they would show and things. Up as tumors like cancer does. Well, no, they wouldn't show up as tumors like cancer. They'd show up as other things on the X-ray, but um, yeah, you can have other things in the lungs related to smoking that are not cancer, but that are just as bad. So, anyhow. It would be nice if we could find these tumors at an earlier stage. So in uh, a couple years ago, uh, between 2002 and 2004, about 50,000 patients were enrolled in this study called the National Lung Screening Trial, the NLST, of which we part I participated in. And half of these patients, so 25,000 or so, got an x-ray. The other half got a CT scan. And then they were followed annually. You know, just randomized. You know, you picked out a card, said, oh, I got a chest x-ray, so you go get the x-ray. I got a CT, you go over there. And so they got three studies, one when they enrolled, one the next year, and one the next year. So over the course of two years, they got one at baseline, one at one year, one at two years. The patients were followed until 2010, so they were followed for a long period of time, relatively long period of time, and these results were reported in 2011, and this is what it showed. That if you, uh, if you were in the group that had a low-dose CT scan, low-dose meaning not much radiation exposure, um, your chance of, develop, of finding a lung cancer was much higher than if you just had a chest x-ray alone. So it seems as if you, had a, if you got a CT scan, that wasn't very good because the doctors found more problems with you. They found more lung cancers. <coughs> but what, what it really meant was that if you look at the deaths from lung cancer, those that had a chest radiograph alone had a much higher death rate from their cancer. So that implies that the CT scan is finding more cancers, but at an earlier stage where you can act upon them and, and treat them and cure them. And another thing that they found was that while well, they found a 20% reduction in the lung cancer deaths, they found a 6.7% per, uh, reduction in deaths from any cause. Meaning, oh, and by the way, you have an aortic aneurysm that we saw on your CT scan. Now you can go get that fixed. Oh, by the way, you had a kidney cancer. Oh, by the way, you got this problem or that problem. So it found other things that were treatable and curable that were not seen on just the plain x-ray group. Now the problem with all this is that about 95% of all the abnormalities that were seen turned out to be nothing. So I see a lot of patients that come to my clinic, they have a spot in their lung, they're worried to death about it. I, I am too. But the truth is 95% of the time it's gonna be nothing. But we have to determine, we have to make sure that's the case. So CT scan screening makes sense. I just showed you the data. Now the question is, who's going to pay for it? <laughs> now, it's cost a lot of money to get a CT scan. If you're going to scan everybody in the United States, every smoker in the United States, a couple thousand dollars a shot, geez, we're bankrupt already. Um, <clears throat> but we do offer a, uh, a package. Sean Perkins, where's Sean at? Sean's in the back there. Anybody in the room is interested in obtaining a CT scan of their chest, for $300 cash, you can get it done. And Medicare is in the process of reviewing it. First it was unfavorably reviewed, now it's favorably reviewed. Sometime in January the final ruling is going to come out to say whether or not Medicare is going to pay for it. I'm all for it. I think it's a great thing. It's going to save many, many patients' lives. The problem is it's going to cost us about $4 trillion. Yes? So again, Doctor, you're recommending the screening for this. How often uh, are you recommending screening? How often is the CDC recommending that? Well, the CDC hasn't, hasn't weighed in on this, and it's not clear how often do you get it. If, when should you start to get it? Some people said 55 to 75 is the age group it should be gotten. Other people say, no, let's make it 40 to 60, because once you've reached 70, I mean, you're gonna, you know, something else is going to get you anyhow, so it's not really going to be cost effective. So we don't really know. Uh, what, the, what, the, what the bottom line is going to be to it all. And a lot of it's going to be dictated by your insurance carrier. They're going to be the ones that are going to tell us what to do. Yes? Uh, what, 
for the for the one the people that are that are getting them done is there some sort of protocol as to or is it just anybody at a certain age well if you want to pay for it out of pocket you can get it at the age of 18. to be recommended by a doctor usually you have you know well a doctor a doctor can recommend it but your insurance won't pay for it okay. so I, I recommend everybody in the room go get one. Well, how, how often is that, that good you? for you think? Is that good for five years? Is it good for ten years? Is it good for two years? What's that? What's the that? Scan itself. When you say, I was scanning yesterday, so I'll see you oh, in five exactly. years. Oh, exactly. Well, some, some of these tumors were identified from year to year. So if you have a scan in January of 2015, that doesn't mean that your scan in January of 2016, a year later, is going to be normal. Many of those cancers can arise within that one year time frame. So one year seems to be about the, the, the cutoff, yes. You can tell how aggressive it is in that length of time? You can, only, you can only tell that. People often ask that. They'll say, well, the doctor has gotten bigger. Well, you can only tell that if you have two scans separated by, separated by some period of time. Well, it depends on how quickly it grows. If, it's, if it grows very, very quickly, maybe a scan every, uh, in, a, in a matter of weeks might show the difference. But if it's a slow-growing tumor, it may not change in the course of a year. But the doctors can tell if it's slow-growing or aggressive. Only if you have two scans to show the, the growth rate. All right, I'm going to get moving here because we've got a bunch of stuff to cover. But <clears throat> so here's some bright spots. Um, some newer things are coming along the, down the pike that are going to help us, I think. One's called ENB, Electromagnetic Navigational Bronchoscopy. Other called VATS, Video Assisted Thoracic Surgery, SBRT, Stereotactic Body Frame Radiotherapy, RFA, Radio Frequency Ablation. Whenever um, patients had a lung tumor, one of the ways to do a biopsy is to look down in the windpipe with this telescope. But the telescope is pretty big. I mean, it's not quite as big as my little finger, but it's a good size. It's bigger than a straw. Well, it can't get down in there too far because it gets stuck. It can't go any further. You can't see anymore. It's like trying to you know, drive your tractor trailer truck through a small tunnel. It just doesn't go. So you can't reach this tumor down here or that tumor right there. Okay? So you can't reach that or that. So you can only get to there. So what's come out is this thing called navigational bronchoscopy. And not to get into the details of it, it's sort of like having a GPS for your lung. So you sort of do a scan. The patient lies down on this machine the machine uh, <clears throat> locates the tumor and the tip of the bronchoscope, and then you can guide it to where you want it to go. And I'll show you a picture of it here in a minute. We do have that available for us here, and the reason why uh, we like it is because it may allow for an accurate diagnosis of cancer when these tumors are identified at a very early stage. Before, you couldn't do anything about it because it was so small you couldn't get there, so you just had to watch it or you had to go to surgery to remove it. But like I said, 95% of the time they were benign. So nowadays what you can do is you can pass this little, this little probe out here into these different tumors and you can actually reach them. So can you show me the navigational bronchoscopy thing? I'm gonna step on over here and we'll, I wanna show you what it looks like. Is it this EMP? Yep. Provides electromagnetic navigation and access to multiple locations in the lung and mediastinum. Just click on to facilitate that. transbronchial needle aspiration of mediastinal lymph nodes, the physician positions the tip of the steerable navigation catheter or locatable guide via the CT images and creates a small dent at the lymph node entry point. The cytology or histology needle can then be inserted into the lymph node and sample collection completed. To access peripheral lesions, electromagnetic guidance is achieved through a sensor incorporated into the distal tip of the steerable navigation catheter. Together with the in-reach guide catheter, or extended working channel, the catheters are inserted into the bronchoscope's own working channel. When the bronchoscope cannot proceed anymore, the steerable navigation and guide catheters are advanced and steered by turning and pulling the dial on the catheter handle. The location and steering directions are performed according to the sensor's position on the CT roadmap relative to the target, which was previously registered to the patient's lung.
When reaching another airway bifurcation, the catheters are again pushed forward and steered by manipulating the handle. After reaching the target, the guide catheter is locked in place and the steerable navigation catheter is removed. The guide catheter now serves as an extension of the bronchoscope channel, providing the position and pathway leading all the way to the target. Through this channel, endobronchial tools are inserted for collection of tissue samples. The Enreach system provides a minimally invasive tool for accessing peripheral lung lesions and mediastinal lymph nodes. Timely diagnostic and treatment decisions of lung disease are possible even in patients with procedure restricting conditions. All right, that's just a cartoon more or less of how this navigational bronchoscopy works. We do have that available here. We just got it, you know, some six months ago or so. Um, pretty cool stuff to be able to, you know, like I said, sort of just tells you make a right, make a left, no, back up, go to the right. You know. Do you have to be put to sleep for that? No, you don't. Um, m many times you are, though, um, but most, but you can, you know, sometimes not. Sometimes not. Okay, let's go back to the slides. <clears throat> All right, what about VATS, video assisted thoracoscopic surgery? Well, again, because of these new uh, high definition screens and cameras, we can do some pretty cool stuff with it. You can make smaller incisions, you can put various instruments in the chest cavity, um, and you can use the, uh, use the VAT system to remove and resect tumors in the lung. While we do have that available to us here, I use that routinely. Not every patient's a candidate for it, uh, but uh, some are. So can we see the, let's just go to the, uh, I'm just gonna do the wedge. Let's just do the wedge. I'm going to show you another video. I didn't make this. This is not made by me. Um, <clears throat> but it, it's what we do in the operating room every day. This is a patient who actually had a tumor uh, in their leg that, that metastasized to their lung. So this uh, surgeon took out this osteosarcoma uh, that was in the lung right here. You can see that's in the right lung right there. And they're going to take it out using this VATS technique. And you can take out the whole lung, or the whole lung or a whole lobe or just that wedge out of the lung right there. I'm gonna move it forward just a little bit to save on some time. You can see this is the size of the, you can see the man's fingers there. Um, you put these little holes in between the ribs. You can see the ribs are the ribs are up there. That's what the lung looks like. I'm um, going to make another, just looking around, you're going to make another incision here in between the ribs. So that's the finger. You put your finger in there to try to feel where you want to go. You put this sort of, uh, this is called a wound protector. It's just sort of a piece of plastic that goes in there and lets instruments slide back and forth easier. You put another various types of instruments in there to fill the lung, grab the lung. So here's the different lobes of the lung. You can see the separation there in the lung. Um, so he's got this instrument in his hands. He's gonna try to grab the lung and pull on it. So you can see what it looks like there. And now he's got a finger in there and he's trying to fill it. Now you're limited because you know you have to have your assistant push the lung up to your finger. Well, you know, if you're trying to feel something hard to feel, you want to get it between your thumb and your finger. You don't want just the tip of your finger because you know it's hard to tell what that is. But if you can get your thumb and fingers around it, then you usually can do a better job. But in this case, they probably did, you know, 15 of these cases before they found one that they could actually fill. So here they found the tumor. This is an actual stapling device that you can see here that you use to staple the lung. That's the mass. Um, so they're grabbing it here. This is the staple line. It actually fires a bunch of staples across the lung. Now they're gonna cut it with a pair of scissors. And then you put it in a bag to get it out. You gotta get it out of the chest now. 
So you put in this sort of baggie, you wrap your sandwiches in. And the reason why you do that is you don't want to pull the tumor out through the chest or you might spread some cancer cells on it. That music is crazy. That's dramatic. Is this what you use in surgery? No, I don't listen to that in surgery. Say so how they're trying to find more, and I, I'm going to stop it there just to, just so I can. But it just gives you an idea of what we what we're able to do in the operating room, the kind of things we're able to see in there, um, using that VATS technique. All right, I want to go on to stereotactic body frame hyperfractionated radiotherapy, um, called SBRT. This also uses a GPS. Everybody wants to use the GPS. But what this does is it tracks the tumor. So when you breathe, you know, you got a tumor here in your lung. Now all of a sudden the tumor's up here. Well, if they're firing the radiation beam down here, um, guess what? I'm, my tumor's now moved up here when I took a breath. So this thing can actually track the tumor in real time. Sometimes what they do is they sort of constrict your chest from breathing so it doesn't move very much. Um, but what it can also do though is it fires many, many different x-ray beams. So if you have a tumor right here in the top part of your lung, you used to come in 30, 30 days, six, you know, five days a week, six weeks, get an x-ray beam right here, straight on. Well, in order to kill the tumor inside my lung, my breast was getting a lot of radiation treatment. My skin, the muscle, the bone, all of that limits how much radiation actually gets to the tumor. So this is a different technique, and I'll show you how it works. And again, we have this now here. It's right across the, through that wall. Um, it's pretty cool. Let's show that. This may put me out of business. <laughs> because it's suggested that in many cases, for early stages of tumor, this technique may be as good as surgery. In the past, radiation treatment consisted of single large doses of radiation that damaged the DNA within the cancer cells of the tumor, thereby killing those cells. However, those large doses of radiation also traveled through the surrounding healthy tissue, exposing normal cells to a significant amount of radiation and killing them as well. The CyberKnife Stereotactic Radio Surgery System uses computer-assisted non-surgical technology to transmit small beams of radiation from several different angles into a tumor, thereby minimizing the exposure of surrounding healthy tissue. Based on CT scan data of a tumor, and the skeletal structure of the body as a reference frame, a high-speed computer-controlled robotic arm is used to track patient and tumor positions during treatment. Instead of one large dose of radiation, the CyberKnife's robotic arm can maneuver and emit single, small-dose radiation beams that can enter the body from up to 1,200 different angles. The goal is to maximize tumor exposure by hitting the tumor with greater amounts of small dose beams. All the while, the surrounding healthy tissue remains unaltered because radiation beams that travel through the healthy tissue consist of such a small dose of radiation. The CyberNet Stereotactic Radio Surgery System is an entirely new approach to radio surgery that okay. eliminates the need for a rigid stereotactic frame, enables painless treatment so, <clears throat> we have more to go, so we got to move forward. So basically what this, what, what this does is this, with this machine, if you have a tumor here, it shines an x-ray beam here, then it moves over a little bit and shines a beam here, and one from the back and one from this side. And all these, inter all these radiation beams all intersect right in the middle where the tumor is. So it's like in the old days when you had a magnifying glass, you'd take, go out in the sun, you'd take all the sun's beams and focus them on one particular little point and it would burn a hole in a piece of wood. So what this does is it uses this GPS system and this fancy robotic arm to move the x-ray beams through space to focus all on the tumor. And again, some people are saying this may be as good as surgery, I don't know. 
We're, the, the, those studies are being done, um, and you know, within the next couple years, we'll start to have some of that data out. Now, here's something called RFA probe. That stands for radio frequency ablation. Basically, what this is is you put this thing in the tumor, this big like spike. You just jam that into the lung, and then you push these little tines that come out of it. I'll show you a picture of this. And then you pass microwaves through it. And basically what it does is it heats the tumor up just like if you were to leave your hot dog in your microwave for too long, you come back, it's all gone. It's all just shriveled away. Well, the same thing happens in the lung. You can put this in there, pass microwaves through it. It destroys the tumor and some of the surrounding lung. You pull the thing out, leaves a little cyst, a little cavity in your lung. After a couple weeks, it's all gone away. So here's a cartoon. Here's what it looks like. So here you can see this is the right lung. That's the tumor right there. You can see here's this thing going through, uh, through the, near the rib, goes into that tumor. You put those little tines out there, and you can see it goes all the way around the tumor. That's the tumor right there. That's the tumor right there. You can see those little tines sticking out of it. Uh, this is the, obviously done under general anesthesia. It takes about an hour or two to do it. Um, pull the thing out and you're done, you go home. Um, you can do it again if, you ha if a tumor comes back. And we do have this available to us as well. So let's look at that if we can. I'm going to show you a video of that and then I'm going to finish up here in just like two more minutes. Yeah, it's underneath there. Radio frequency ablation or RFA, is a non-surgical procedure used to treat cancerous tumors. RFA is most commonly used for tumors of the lung, liver, and kidney, up to five centimeters in diameter. That's this about the size of a baseball. This procedure provides an alternative for cancer treatment when surgery is not an option. For ablation of a lung tumor, the RFA procedure is performed with the patient lying comfortably in a CT scanner. Frequently, only minimal sedation is necessary. Grounding pads are placed on the patient's thighs during the procedure. Scans are taken before the treatment and at times throughout the procedure to aid in guidance. First, a CT scan is taken to locate the tumor. There's the tumor. A lidocaine shot is given to numb the area. This may feel like a bee sting. Radio frequency ablation kills cancer cells using heat on the end of a probe created by an electrical current at radio wave frequency. The RFA probe is placed directly into the tumor. Multiple probes may be used depending on the size, shape, and location of the tumor to increase the area of effect. Once the probes are in place, current is applied at the end of the probes. This current increases the temperature of surrounding tumor cells, destroying a spherical area of cells around the end of the probe. This area is called the ablation zone. A one centimeter margin of healthy tissue is included in the ablation zone. This is to ensure that the entire tumor has been treated. Okay. A final CT scan is taken to confirm the full area of the tumor was treated, and the patient may be able to return home the same day. So we do have that available to us here. Uh, we do use it. Um, I would have to say that surgery uh, is the, uh, go the gold standard for early stages of lung tumors. These other things I showed you, the RFA, SBRT, those would, be those, those would be used for tumors that are confined to the lung. Obviously, you wouldn't use that last technique, RFA, if the tumor had already spread to the liver or to the lymph nodes or something. So these are competing with surgery, and they're competing with me. But um, <laughs> if they're better, then, then so be it. But um, right now, surgery still remains the gold standard. So patients always come in and say, I want that new thing I saw. I saw, I heard that on 60 Minutes, they have this thing. Well, you know, right now the truth is that neither SBRT or RFA is better than surgery. Now they may be, and as techniques improve, they might, they might uh, do better than surgery. 
So what about prevention of lung cancer? Well, don't smoke. That's the most important thing you can say. But there has been nothing that's been done or studied or shown to prevent lung cancer except cigarettes uh, avoidance. Exercise lowers the risk of all different types of cancers. You can find that is suggest that if you exercise, your risk of lung cancer is lower, colon cancer is lower, breast cancer is lower, but the data is very weak and it's very conflicting. We also know that diets uh, may play a role. Unfortunately, it's been shown that if you eat a lot of beta carotene, you know, carrots, you actually have a higher risk of lung cancer. So, uh, you know, that you may not want to do that. You may not, may not want to have your V8 every morning. So in summary, we got just one, well, I'm one minute over, but lung cancer is a deadly disease. Um, I wish it weren't the case, but that's, that's the truth. The truth is it's diagnosed late when there's very little treatment options. An ounce of prevention, certainly worth a pound of cure. Um, if any patient has any symptom, we encourage them to seek attention early because the more you delay it, the more likely it is to spread. Surgery is still the treatment of choice when it can be done safely. It's better than radiation therapy, chemotherapy, RFA, SBRT, ABC, DEF, whatever you may want to put in there. Surgery is the best thing you can do if, if it can be done safely and if it can be uh, done to help the patient. And as I said, there are alternatives to surgery are being developed every day. And someday they may actually you know, supersede surgery as far as the treatment of choice.